President, fellows and guests. Thanks to the careful preservation of significant numbers of medieval records, numerous seal impressions are available in repositories. The National Archives alone has been estimated to hold some 50,000 examples. And in the British Isles as a whole, there could be some several hundreds of thousands. Although there is a wealth of sigillographic material, our knowledge of how people in medieval England and Wales used seals remains incomplete. Scholars have devoted considerable attention to the seals elite, whose changing preferences for various types of seals have been charted across the entirety of the medieval period. By contrast, the seals of people of lesser standing remain less well known. Their preferences also changed over time, but the chronology of the changes, together with their speed and scale, remains to be precisely established. The purpose of my part of the contribution today is to investigate in a holistic fashion the changing sigillographic fashions in England and Wales from circa 1150 to 1550. And what I will demonstrate is that major changes in the sigillographic system can be discerned and that the system as a whole is remarkably dynamic. Now, the large numbers of surviving seals can be subject to quantitative analysis. However, it is only recently, with the appearance of two new data sets, that it has become practical to pursue this type of analysis for an entire region and over a large time scale. The findings I am presenting today are based on evidence from two data sets. The first comes from the National Archives, which has one of the world's most extensive seal collections. It is also a leader in the development of innovative systems for recording and making sigillographic information publicly accessible. Of particular importance to research using quantitative methods is the National Archives Electronic Seal Catalog, which was developed by Paul Harvey and Trevor Chalmers. Currently, the catalog contains information on almost 4,000 seal impressions, of which approximately 3,600 are dated prior to 12, 1550, and so fall within the temporal parameters of this analysis. The catalog includes seals from a number of series, including DL25, 26, as well as LR14 and LR15. As the key constituents from, of the catalog are the seals from DL25 and 26, which are records that originate in the archive of the Duchy of Lancaster. For the purposes of this talk today, I will call it the Duchy of Lancaster catalog. At this stage, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Paul Harvey for his kind assistance as well as Adrian Ailes, whose considerable efforts to make the whole catalog accessible to TNA. The second data set I'm using was created for the AHRC funded Seals in Medieval Wales project, CMU. The project ran from 2009 to 12 and was based at Aberystwyth University and Bangor University. The principal investigator of the project was Professor Philip Schofield, with Dr. Sue Johns acting as co-investigator. I designed the data management system, and the data was compiled by myself with Dr. New. The CME data set contains information on 3,168 medieval seal impressions. So it is comparable in size to the Dutch of Lancaster catalog. However, where the Dutch of Lancaster catalog is based on material from one repository, the seals in medieval Wales data set includes material gathered from a number of them. The collections in the data set include seals from the National Library of Wales, as well as the British Library, Hereford Cathedral Archives, and a number of other local repositories. From a methodological perspective, the seals in medieval Wales project follows on from the work done at TNA, and thus its data is compatible with the Duchy of Lancaster catalog. When the two data sets are joined together, they offer a significant body of evidence covering a large geographical region for the period circa 1150 to 1550. The combined data set contains information on 6,795 individual seal impressions. The number of records in the sample is a useful but crude method of evaluating its quality because the geographical 
geographical distribution of the seal impressions is as important as the quantity. The Duchy of Lancaster property holdings were dispersed across England, and thus this Duchy of Lancaster seal catalogue offers good coverage of seals used in that region. By contrast, the seals in medieval Wales data set, which refers to this map here, is focused on Wales and the marshes. It has particular strengths in North Wales and Southeastern Wales, but it also incorporates considerable material from the bordering English areas. Also affecting the reliability of the sample is the temporal distribution of the seal impressions. The Duchy of Lancaster catalog includes seal impressions dated from the mid 12th century onwards, but its particular strength is in the 13th century. By contrast, the seals in medieval Wales data set is more evenly distributed and is stronger than the Duchy of Lancaster material for the 14th and 15th centuries. For the purposes of my talk today, I have combined the data from both catalogs and organized the seal impressions into eight temporal periods. All the 12th century material is integrated together because only a handful can be dated prior to 1150. Even so, the evidence for the 12th century is limited and amounts to only 168 examples. However, for subsequent periods, the data is quite rich. More than 1,000 impressions are dated to the first half of the 13th century, and more than 1,500 the second half of the century. In the subsequent periods, the average number of impressions is approximately 700. Although each data set is important individually, in combination, their significance is greater than some of their parts. With the impressions dated and divided into historical periods, then they need to be classified according to their visual content, so the most popular motifs in each period can be identified. Fortunately, seals are generally small, and as they normally have only one central motif, they are readily amenable to classification. For the purposes of this analysis, the motifs were classified using a system developed with seals in medieval Wales project. The system of classification focuses on what Panofsky defined as the primary or, quote, natural subject matter. A description of a visual resource in these terms is factual, e.g., this is a painting of 13 men having dinner, rather than this is a painting of the Last Supper. The seal from medieval Wales seal classification system has a hierarchical tree structure in which the upper levels contain broad categories and lower levels specific ones. Moreover, the categories at each level are mutually exclusive, so each seal can only be located in one at each level of the hierarchy. Thus, we can determine how many seals at any particular level have been assigned to a particular category, and how common they are in the overall sample. With the data structured in this manner, the shifting fashions and seal motifs can be easily tracked over time as they rise and fall. Despite the limitations of the data available for the 12th century, the general trends in seal uses in this period can be discerned. The single most important category of seals from this period is those that display a representation of an animal, including all types of mammals, birds, and fish. 27% fall into that category. The other important category is those depicting an armored man on horseback, which form 22% of the sample. This motif is generally familiar to scholars since they are frequently used by members of the male aristocracy. Alongside these two groups of seals, which together constitute more than half the sample, are a small but important group that display a bust of some type, whether in the form of an antique gem or a medieval depiction of the head and shoulders of perhaps an abbot. Another group that can be discerned is the seals with radial motifs, which are designs that are symmetrical along a number of axes with arms or radii extending from a central point. These radii or arms can have pointed ends, creating a star pattern, or they can bulge so they resemble petals, creating the impression of a flower. Four percent of the seals have this motif. And finally, there are representations of stylized lilies. There are a number of variants of this motif, but they are nonetheless readily identifiable as members of a particular group and form eight percent of the seals in this period. So in total, Almost 70% of the seals can be classified as animals, armored men on horseback, busts, radial motifs, or stylized lilies. 
The remainder of the seals present a wide range of different motifs, but none of them are numerically significant. In the 13th century, all these categories of seals remain important, but their relative prominence shifts. In the first half of the century, the portion of the seals which show armored men on horseback declines from 22% to 9%. The portion of the seals which show animals also decreases, but the decline is less dramatic, for they drop from 27% to 17%. The number of seals with busts also decreases, but the winners in this period are the stylized lilies and the radio motifs. The portion of the seals with stylized lilies climbs from 8% to 25%, while well, the number of radial seals increases from 4% to 18%. Together, these two categories of seals now account for 33% of the seals in the sample. A new motif also begins to edge into prominence. The early 13th century witnessed the growing popularity of seals depicting shields. 5% of the seals of this period display a shield of some sort as their key motif. In the second half of the century, the portion of the seals with busts or animal motifs remained steady at 6 to 18% respectively. Both the stylized lilies and the radio motifs continue to be extremely popular, although they exchange positions in the ranking. Stylized lilies, which accounted for 25% of all the seals in the first half of the century, slipped gently to 21%. Meanwhile, the radio seals increased their popularity slightly, moving up to 23%. The portion of the seals formed by the equestrian seals, however, continues to decline. Representations of the armored men on horseback never disappear entirely, but from the mid 13th century onwards, they will hover around 1% of the seals in circulation. In their place, the number of seals with the shield motif continues to climb, reaching 10%. Overall, the 13th century is dominated by the stylized elite and the radio. The beginning of the 14th century saw a dramatic change in the most popular seal motifs. In the first half of the century, people discarded the use of the Stalazili, which as a percentage of the total group plummets from 21% to 2%. In a similar fashion, radial seals also declined, although not as dramatically, but they only slipped to 10%. In their place, people were taking a renewed interest in representations of the human head, which climbed from 6 to 9%. There's also an increase in the use of animal teeth, which rise to 28% of the time and the number of seal impressions displaying shields, which rises to 26%. Edging into view, statistically speaking, is a new motif, which for the first time starts to appear in significant numbers. Throughout the 13th century, seals were conventionally designed with a motif at the center and a text around the exterior. In the 14th century, an increasing portion of the seal displayed a monogram or simply a letter in the design field. These seals, which for the purposes of this paper, I'm going to classify as textual texts, form 2% of the sample in the first half of the 13th century. In the second half of the 14th century, the number of busts returned to 6% and the annual motifs to 20%. The bulk of the seals now display shields, which rise to 34% of the total. Another big winner are the textual seals, which climb from 2% to 10%. The dramatic decline of the stylized lilies and the radial seals in the first part of the century has proved final. Like the armored men on horseback, the stylized lily motif never entirely disappears in circulation, but until the end of the Middle Ages, they only constitute approximately 1% of the seals. The radial motifs also decline, but settle at a marginally higher figure of approximately 3%. In sum, there is clear evidence that the 14th century, 13th century pattern of seals which discarded and there is some continuity between the 14th and 15th centuries, but also considerable change. In the first half of the 15th century, bust and animal seals hover at around 6 and 18 percent, respectively, of the sample, while the armored equestrian figures, radial and stylized lily motifs, all remain at a low percentage of the total. The key development is the abrupt decline in the number of seals displaying shields which shift from 34% to 15. The motif whose popularity is climbing is the textual seals, which surge from 10% to 36%. Between the first and second halves of the 15th century, there's considerable evidence for continuity. Most of the categories of seals already discussed remain steady at their early 15th century levels, 
although the portion is sealed with shields continues to slip, declining from 15% to 9%. Moreover, there's also considerable continuity between the pattern of seal usage in the second half of the 15th century and into the first half of the 16th century. The portion of seals with animal motifs declines from 19% to 13%, and there is a slight rise in the number of textual seals. Thus, in the 15th century, a new pattern of seal usage again took hold, but it continued into the 16th century. So, to conclude, a very large number of seal impressions survive from medieval England and Wales. As they can be readily classified, they can be analyzed quantitatively. The provisional results presented in this paper, which are based on the combined data in the Duchy of Lancaster and seals in medieval Wales data sets, signal the potential of this approach. As more sigillographic data is compiled and becomes publicly accessible, our understanding of the complexities and nuances of the sigillographic system will improve. Nonetheless, in my portion of the presentation today, I have sketched the key developments across a period of 400 years. The beginnings of the 13th century witnessed the decline of the armored man on horseback, with a portion of the total seals in circulation, um, which as a portion of the total seals in circulation was quickly overwhelmed by the seals with radial and stylized lily motifs. However, in the 14th century, in turn, they too went quickly out of fashion and were supplanted by the shields. In the 15th century, the shields were also displaced as the most popular motif by the textual seals. Thus, the pattern of fashions and seal usage was extraordinarily dynamic, and changes in the use of seals can be discerned not only between centuries, but even between half centuries. Indeed, many people living in medieval England and Wales would have perceived these changes within their own lifetimes. Now, armed with an understanding of how the civilographic system as a whole developed, scholars can contemplate confidently proceed to investigate the significance of individual motifs and the changing importance of these fashions. At this stage, I'd like to hand over to my colleague. As we have seen, the Seals in Medieval Wales project has established a recording and categorization template that enables rigorous interrogation of data, especially with a view to detecting temporal patterns in the type of motif employed on the field. One point about the data set, which I think is worth emphasizing, is that it's as representative as possible. With the exceptions of the Harley Charters and the Hereford Cathedral Archive material, which have to some for uh, reasons of time, all surviving seals within each collection were recorded uh, as long as they fell within the temporal and uh, geographical parameters of the project. This all inclusive approach was also taken by Professor Harvey in his catalogue of the Dutch of Lancaster materials. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Kim pointed out, that provided an invaluable model for our project. But this all inclusive approach to recording every single field within a collection regardless of motif or user, is in marked contrast to a number of other catalogues. Faced with the Herculean task of recording seals in what was then still British Museum collections, one cannot blame Walter de Grey Birch for a selective approach. But his methods um, undoubtedly have influenced the way scholars have studied and thought about seals. In particular, the only three, only three categories of motif used on personal seals that the Birch recorded were equestrian, standing female figure, and armorial devices. And all three have dominated studies of personal seals from the late 19th century to the present day. This is no doubt partly because these motifs are the ones most commonly employed on the seals of the nobility by knights, esquires, and gentry, the groups in society that have received most attention from historians uh, in uh, total. However, when one looks at the number of seals, and I'm talking about here for a moment impressions and motifs combined, that bear these motifs, it becomes immediately obvious that they represent only a very small portion of the extant material. 
And I should just note that when we record something as shield, so to speak, this includes a lot of shield with merchant marks or with what might be deemed um, pseudo or more or trade related. So a lot of the shield in our samples are not, strictly speaking, correctly or more. Now, this observation about the vast majority of surviving seals. Um, having received the least attention is not a new one. In 1906, John Harvey Bloom noted that, and I quote, the seals of simple gentry, merchants, and yeomen have not yet had justice done for them. And it's interesting that Bloom doesn't even acknowledge that people below the gentry or the yeomen would be the youth. Professor Harvey, uh, Professor Heslop, and Andrew McGuinness also all noted very clearly that non omnivorous personal seals contribute to the majority of surviving, mater the, the surviving material, but remain the least valued type of seal. And as recently as 2009, Richard Linenthal was still lamenting virtual absence of systematic work on seals, matrices in that instance, used by, I quote, ordinary men and women. Systematic recording and the possibilities for analysis offered by databases, as just demonstrated by Dr. McEwen, now make it possible to start to redress this balance. In particular, the ability to employ quantitative analysis, and, uh, allied with access to images with embedded metadata, makes it much easier for a deeper analysis of what are often categorized as generic or conventional motifs. And when we look more closely, nuances, nuances of meaning can indeed be revealed. Two seals from the animal category of the seals in medieval royal data set will serve as initial examples of this nuanced meaning being found within superficially fairly generic motifs. The first is that used by Richard Banner of Bridgman chaplain to validate exchange of a small amount of land um, near the town of Bridge North in 1295. And some of you may have seen this in the um, project curated exhibition of National Library last year. So actually might be about to say about it. The lion attacking the rather sad looking wyvern type monster is at first glance just another example of the familiar competitive creatures motif. This image is transformed by the legend post Kenabras Sparrow Lucia into something overtly religious, the, the uh, fight between darkness and light, good and evil. More obviously devotional, um, and I, I promise you these, um, three hairs as the head, body, ear, head, body, ear, body, head, ear. The, this seal was used by John, son of Robert Locksmith, in 1330, again, in the Bridge North area. The three hairs motif is found in many cultures, but in medieval Europe, it was principally identified as the type of the Holy Trinity, the three bodies, all looking as though they have two ears, but actually only three, sharing three ears in total. It's a neat visual means of explaining a very complex theological issue. It's often for this reason seen as an example of pedagogical iconography, but here it seems to reflect personal devotion, particularly since, according to medieval vestries, the hair represents those who, despite their own weakness, put their trust completely in God. An additional interpretation may be proposed based on the seal user, and unfortunately, tries to might be not being able to read the legend. A rhyme about the three hairs motif from 16th century France invites the viewer to turn and turn again to see the hairs run, at which point the issue of the number of ears becomes apparent. Now, as Dr. McKeown noted when he first encountered this scene, the central hole, or, um, it's actually a, a raised um, dot, between the ears and the motion of 
shares brings to mind the lock, perhaps the key turning within the lock. And it's tempting to speculate whether a variant of this puzzle drive is current in 14th century England, since this image was used by family locksmiths. While it's perhaps not surprising to find nuanced meaning encoding within the images of humans, animals, or certain types of objects, it is the so-called conventional motifs employed on so many personal scenes that can provide some of the least expected insights into those who are use them. In this category are the stylized lilies, flowers, branches, stars, and crosses that abound on seals from across medieval Britain. From the rest of this paper, I'm going to be focusing on the radial pattern. And as we've seen that from the both the Seals in Medieval Wales and the TNA data sets were especially popular in the 13th century, but actually come from the entire medieval period. But before proceeding, we must address the problem of terminology, because the vocabulary for non omnicure seal design lacks standardization. The category of radial motif encompasses those that may be described as stylized flowers. Branch, leaves, stars, or lava crosses. There are most certainly different things in these patterns, and it's sometimes clear that the image was intended to represent a flowering blue or contra branches laid in radial pattern. However, the same motif may be recorded by one person as conifer branches, but another as ears of our project has distinguished between motifs of, sort of flowers with rounded petals, branches with ragged edges, and stars with arms open to forms. But all also, however, come under the umbrella term radial. But why, I'm sure some of you are wondering, does this matter? When they are discussed at all, radial motifs are firmly within the category of conventional design. And either overtly or by implication um, assigned to those seals used by men and women at the lower levels of society. Furthermore, while scholars have noted considerable variation within these four categories, practically no one has asked whether this has significance beyond the whim or artistic power of the human it's certainly true that the radial pattern is easy to produce, and matrices with this design are therefore potentially within the range of lower state series. Indeed, Professor Heslop noted that stylized flowers and elaborated crosses were two of the three main categories of seal design for being animals and birds. Available in the 12th and 13th centuries to, I quote, a layman who was not of the knight in class. And with this, we encounter two challenges. The first being that, despite the efforts of scholars from Foster and Hilton, through Rathless and Dyer to Harvey and Schofield, many of this generally still focus on the upper levels of society. This historiographical bias is then compounded by the fact that the seals of non elite users generally have been poorly recorded and certainly very poorly And I would suggest that when a sigillographic motif is assumed principally to have been uh, used by low status men and women, a perfect storm is thus created. Fewer scholars are interested in such seal use in the first place, and there is less access to the material. Plus, the design is assumed to be standardized at the point of production, and therefore not worth exploring in great deal of detail. Instead, it's clear that, in at least some cases, not only can seals with radial motifs reveal significant evidence about people who own them, but that we should also be very cautious about viewing this and other so-called conventional motifs as an automatic indicator that the user was from the lower or middle east level. Turning to the material itself, radial motifs within the sealed and medieval Wales data set appear across the whole geographic region to Wales and the Marches. 
and were used by both men and women. As with the Duchy of Lancaster, as we've already seen, their most common in the 13th century period. So a lot of this question is not why this motif was fat or popular, but why it was used at all. What did it mean? Did it have a meaning? Is it really just an attractive, easy to produce image? The motif is not based upon the representation of the human form and therefore does not classify by social type in the same manner as, for example, the equestrian scene. Instead, it has closer affinities with heraldic devices, devices that were being placed on seals just as these radial motifs emerge as common. These motifs, therefore, operate within the same semiotic framework as devices which retrospectively are often termed armorial or photo armorial, a very interesting term. And I would suggest that this should be read in this context as signs encoded with culture specific meaning. Andrew McGuinness, among others, warned, and again I quote, there are dangers in employing terms such as conventional to describe seal designs because there are often subtle differences. And certainly the variety is important when we're looking at such material from the field and as well as they set here are just a few examples of radial. All radial but very different in detail. And when you look in in the detail, certain one off examples and subsets emerge. And they force us to re examine whether these have and certainly to whether they can be ascribed to certain types of seal user. Let's start with the seal of John Minor, used to validate a grant to Morgan Abbey in the 13th century. Now, at first glance, it fits comfortably within the radial category. Stylized flower, admittedly quite small for the period, it's only 20 millimetres. On closer inspection, however, we see that each petal actually bears a chalice. Stamen's nails, and this, I'm afraid on screen looks like a blob in the middle, appears to be a lion's head or face. It's a passion flower. The Reverend Dr. David Williams interprets the lion's head as the Lion of Judah, but since the Leonine imagery permeates the Bible, this part of the design is open to multiple interpretations. It's a powerful, theologically mutable, and yet devotionally specific and highly sophisticated image. But what's perhaps most striking is that the seal displays what superficially would be described as a conventional motif. Another example of a small seal with a stylized flower motif makes it absolutely clear that not only could such images be sophisticated, but that they were not only used by lower status, but some of the very highest status seal owners in the medieval world. This impression is attached to a document dated 1265, and as you can see, each petal bears a shield of arms. This is attached to a document from South Wales, so yes, those of you who are familiar with the heraldry will have spotted correctly bear the Clare arms. The younger brother, perhaps, or female relative, one of the more senior members of the Clare family? No. In fact, this is one of the seals of Gilbert the Clare, Gilbert the Red, Earl of Gloucester and Hertford, sometime ally of Simon de Montfort, and son in law of Edward I, one of the most powerful men in England in the period. Clear evidence, I think you'll agree, that the stylized flower motif on the seal is not. Of a lower status. Well, these one off examples are of interest, they may, of course, be aberration. So it's important to look at subsets within the radial category. And in this instance, I think that we can start to see with careful exploration that not only should we re evaluate state social status of the users of this motif, but they can also provide information about 
reaching trends and nuances of perhaps even family relationships. Ten seals are a total of 16 impressions but from 10 original matrices. Used to validate documents relating to Margam Abbey. All have long, thin arms terminating round or tear shaped rock shaped distinct spikes. And I would suggest that these are perhaps stylized representations of seasons. Reverend Dr. William described this motif as an S cover, assigning to it a term that raises the expectations of the more in charge. And I'm going to return to this um, in, a, in a moment. All ten seals with this motif belong to the neck. Eight of whom were made of Welsh, one of whom was from Anglo Norman settler family, and one whose name has suggested uh, Anglo Welsh origins. All ten men were active within the um, Confed and uh, of our north areas of Glamorgan, and all impressions. Seals or appeal motifs within the seals of medieval Wales data set appear across the whole geographic region, so Wales and the Marches, and were used by both men and women. As with the Duchy of Lancaster, as we've already seen, they're most common in the 13th century, due to this period. So, an obvious question is not why this motif was perhaps was popular, but why it was used at all. What did it mean? Did it have a meaning? Is it really just an attractive, easy to produce image? The motif is not based upon the representation of the human form and therefore does not classify by social type in the same manner as, for example, the equestrian scene. Instead, it has closer affinities with heraldic devices, devices that will be placed on seals just as these radial motifs emerge. These motifs therefore operate within the same semiotic framework as devices which retrospectively are often termed armorial or proto armorial, a very interesting term. And I would suggest that this should be read in this context as signs included with culture specific meaning. Andrew McGuinness, among others, warned, and again I quote, there are dangers in employing terms such as conventional describe seal designs, because there are often subtle differences. And certainly the variety is important when you're looking at such material, from the field of medieval world data set here are just a few examples of radial. All radial, but very different in detail. And when you look in, in the detail, certain one-off examples and subsets emerge. And they force us to re-examine whether these have specific meaning, and certainly to whether they can be ascribed to certain types of seal user. Let's start with the seal of John Minor, used to validate a grant from Morgan Abbey in the 13th century. Now, at first glance, it fits comfortably within the radial category. Stylized flower, admittedly quite small for the period, it's only 20 millimetres. On closer inspection, however, we see that each petal actually bears a chalice. Stamen's nails, and this, I'm afraid on screen, looks like a blob in the middle, appears to be a lion's head face. It's a passion flower. The Reverend Dr. David Williams interprets the lion's head as the lion of Judah, but since the Leonine imagery permeates the Bible, this part of design is open to multiple interpretations. It's a powerful, theologically musical, and yet devotionally specific and highly sophisticated image. But what's perhaps most striking is that the seal displays what superficially would be described as a conventional motif. Another example of a small seal with a stylized flower motif makes it absolutely clear that not only could such images be sophisticated, but they, they were not only used by lower status, but some of the very highest status seal owners in the medieval world. This impression is attached to a document dated 1265, and as you can see, each 
of Shu Arts. This is attached to a document from South Wales, so yes, those of you who are familiar with the Herald Reed will just watch it correctly, they're the Clare Arms. The younger brother, perhaps, or female relative, one of the more senior members of the Clare family, perhaps? No. In fact, this is one of the seals of Gilbert the Clare, Gilbert the Red, Earl of Gloucester and Hertford, sometime ally of Simon de Montfort, and son-in-law of Edward I, one of the most powerful men in England in the period. Clear evidence, I think you'll agree, that the stylized flower motif on a seal is not necessarily indicative of a lower status to Well, While these one-off examples are of interest, they may, of course, be aberrations. So it's important to look at subsets within the radial category. And in this instance, I think that we can start to see with careful exploration that not only should we re-evaluate the, the social status of the users of this motif, but they can also provide information about regional trends and nuances of Relationships. Ten seals, a uh, total of 16 impressions, but from ten original matrices, used to validate documents relating to Margam Abbey, all have long, thin arms terminating in round or tear shaped rock shaped distinct spikes. And I would suggest that these are perhaps stylized representations of the season. Reverend Dr. William described this motif as an S cover, assigning to it a term that raises the expectation of a more in a church. And I'm going to return to this uh, in, a, in a moment. All ten seals with this motif belong to men, eight of whom were native Welsh, one of whom was from an Anglo Norman settler family, and one whose name has, has suggested uh, Anglo Welsh origin. All ten men were active within the um, Kenfegan uh, of our north areas of Glamorgan, and all impression seals were appended to documents dated all the first quarter of the 13th century. An obvious suggestion would be that the matrices were produced by one craftsman of the workshop that just happened to use a variant of the generic radio motif. I'm not excluding this possibility, but they were certainly not or produced the match. And there is enough variation to suggest that there are different engravers or that they were engraved at different times. Instead, I suggest that the motif that the choice of this motif is a deliberate one on the part of the seal owner, connected to refined gradation status within kinship groups and also to the locality. Those of you who are not particularly familiar with South Wales, South of Wales, this is the general area, and this is the specific, there's Margam Abbey, and the area that the seal owners are from is this, this um, part of the region. And that includes uplands and some lowland coastal areas. One of the seals with this motif was owned by Griffith at Cadogan, Gilmichael, a member of a family of Irish origins who held land around King Feg, which is on the right of the coast, now almost disappeared on the sand. Interestingly, the seal of his kinsman, Wallavet, includes clear representation of teams, as you can see them up here, but also includes the bow with an arrow ready to shoot a motif found on a number of other seals from South Wales in this period, uh, with obvious resonances to the famed bowmen of the area. Griffith himself held land, but in one quick claim to Margam Abbey, the document was validated as the seal of Morgan at Caradol, Lord of Abal, and the most powerful native ruler in the region, confirming Griffith's position as what in English terms would be a lesser nobleman or a member of the developing knightly class. Another teasing seal owner was Rhys and I showed his seal um, 
prepared with a real teas. He was a member of a native Welsh family who controlled the lowlands between Old Law and Fec, but that in the same area. On a number of occasions, he witnessed documents along with Alistair Abibna, who, who, with his brother Ilwa, has been described as one of the most significant native landowners in the upland area, immediately northwest of Morgan Abbey. Both Alistair and Ilwa owned teasel seals, with images and letter forms so similar that the matrices were almost certainly made at the same time. In fact, all the native Welshmen who owned seals with teasel motifs were members of the landholding and military active nobility in the region, the Echelwe, but were not the preeminent power within their kinship group or the Region. All undoubtedly knew each other, as well as the Anglo Norman teal seal owner David Scarlage, and we know this from witnesses. They're operating often in the exactly the same, same document. David Scarlage held a knight's fee liable to castle guard at Cardiff and was a member of a settler family of roughly comparable status to the Welsh owners of the seal. Indeed, like this scholar, David Scurlage acknowledged, quite reluctantly, I have to say, Morgan at Paradox as his overlord. From this evidence, it can be at least proposed that the image may have been used to indicate a certain mid level status within the landholding elite of Glamorgan in the early 13th century. Quite what the image meant is less clear beyond this categorisation within and locality. Teasels were used in the Middle Ages um, in the cloth making process, although there's no evidence of cloth industry in South Wales at this time beyond home production. There were, however, significant machines. Pasture rights are frequently mentioned in the documentation. And indeed led to a number of disputes between seal owners and more than Were the teals packed an oblique reference to status through pasture rights, the ownership of sheep, or perhaps even to increasingly possible all, particularly given that all these rights were being contested between these seal owners and the Cistercian monks? What is certain is that in one case, the teal seal uh, motif passed down to another generation in the manner of what might later be termed the correct or moral device. Owen, Rees, and Caradoc, sons of Alifa, were in frequent and often violent disputes with Morgan Abbey about land and property in the 1220s and 40s. The Bishop of Sandaf had to intervene on more than one occasion. And in about 1231, a final concord was drawn up between the brothers and the monks of Margaret, with the former quits claiming their rights in various lands and swearing not to enter one of the monks' range, ranges because of the damage they and their men, so another indication of their level here in the native society, they and their men had previously done property. All three brothers attended a seal with a name legend so we can identify who is being represented by which seal. That of Greece Scholar, uh, I'm sorry, beg your pardon, Greece at Alifa, uh, which is this one, resembles in a way that of his father and uncle. And you can just about see here the quite thin um, arm and then um, blob at the end, and this distinctive segmentation that we see on the, on the father's seal. But his brothers, Owen and Caradoc, have very, very similar seals, almost certainly made as a set, but are mimicking this motif, but not quite following it exactly. Priest used his seal again on the deed of 1246, but on that occasion, his brothers used different ones employed the, uh, on the earlier documents. Um, Owen used a uh, stylized lily, and Caradoc used another radial motif quite distinct from that one. 
It may well be that reefs have a seal, perhaps deliberately, quite deliberately, you employing a family motif by 1231. But where his brothers did not, so that either they or Margaret supplied them or themselves with nature seas for that occasion. With a radial motif, perhaps showing the craftsman um, uh, reefs seal, but, but the nuances of the copying of the design of the father seal do not then translate these other two brothers. So, in effect, the possible development of what later would be called armorial devices descending through the family. What I hope these examples have demonstrated is that, as well as an ability to map high level trends, data recording of seals in digital format, allied with images, provide powerful new tools to solve. In particular, for probably the first time, we have the ability to record and interrogate very large numbers of seals, which previously have been lamentably under-investigated. I've deliberately raised a number of questions and made suggestions with no firm yet. What I hope we have shown is that sigillographic research is entering a new and exciting phase, and that through, the, through this, seals of all kinds not just those used by the elites, will take the deserved place, the rich source of evidence.